Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Time for us to go ahead and get started with our class so this morning. Uh, if you'll bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come entering your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, with, with joy in, in our minds as we consider your blessings of this week. Contemplate the blessings uh, to, to come as we walk in your paths, as we do those things that are pleasing in your sight. We, we ask that you continue to bless us, continue to strengthen and encourage us, to, to challenge us, to help us uh, grow in, in understanding and grace and just in every way that you have imagined for us. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the body of believers that meets here, willingness to, to come and open up your word and, and study and, and dig into these wonderful truths with, with the purpose of making them real in, the, in their lives, in their actions, their thoughts, and in their attitudes. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that you give us a uh, an opportunity to minister to those who are around us each day, to open those doors and, and give us the strength to walk through. Heavenly Father, we, we, we look at the world around us at times and, and are so often discouraged and give us hearts that see past that discouragement to, to a time which, in which we can affect a great change and bring back the spiritual uh, a renewed spirituality and revival. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for uh, just uh, all that you do for us, especially your son who came and, and taught in, in this world, took on the form of uh, a man and went to a cross and died so that we can, because of that sacrifice, have a home with you. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. We are... In the final two weeks, uh, last week we kind of introduced the week, played the video, uh, got a little bit of discussion uh, in, uh, and then uh, today uh, we are going to start uh, kind of the homework uh, that you were supposed to uh, do. So we're going to just jump uh, right in, uh, but uh, does anybody, just before we kind of jump in and start going through the questions uh, and the format that, uh, you know, that I've given you, uh, do, does anybody have any, um, uh, anything that's just kind of stands out about the, the lesson, uh, stands out about this particular lesson that, um, that, that really kind of touched you or, or something that you would like to uh, share. No? Yes, it's fine. Um, and something that really touched me was the um, number 11, he's the, like the captain of the opposite team, when he said, Okay, yeah, uh, those are good moments in the video to teach us a couple of things. Um, one, and I guess the first we're talking about is, is kind of that age-old question uh, of what is the balance between, you know, you know, how am I supposed to feel or react or, or you know, where am I? Uh, and then it's almost hard to even put into question form when, when I do end up doing, you, you know, some pretty great things um, through God, 
uh, and I want to acknowledge God, but then there's, you know, my part. I mean, uh, you know, it's a big lesson in humility. How do I maintain uh, that humility? Um, and I think that's what that fellow was driving at. You know, who are we uh, that all the attention should be, you know, kind of focused on us? Uh, and it kind of reminds you of that question that's asked in the Bible. You know, what is man that thou art mindful uh, of him? Uh, and, you know, we, we understand that that answer is not exactly the, the simplest um, thing to give. Because on one hand, um, th there's very little we could do. I mean, if we're standing in the presence of God, uh, then everything that we do looks like, uh, according to you, you know, some writers in the Bible, filthy rags. Um, because of our position that we have with regard to sin and obedience and keeping God's boundaries. Um, but then there's also the expectation of God uh, that we can do great things um, through him. You, you know, and he shows that through guys like, you know, Gideon uh, and, of course, Joseph uh, and, and so many other people, Daniel, uh, in the Bible. Uh, so, you know, where do you strike that balance? Uh, and uh, I think that balance always begins by us always seeking to be humble. If you're not asking that question, you know, why should we be getting all this attention? Then it's probably the most important question that you should be asking. Uh, because we're asking the question, it typically indicates, you know, some, some semblance of uh, humility. And the other one, um, you remember in the video they were talking about the lighting of a single candle in a dark stadium uh, and how everybody could see it. And um, a couple things about that. One of them is not um, really relevant to the point that he was making, but just kind of a reminder, uh, we gave this uh, kind of admonition at the beginning of the series, um, but uh, there have been some questions, so uh, just remind us. This, this video series, this movie, um, and not, not the notes, because we redo them, or I redo them, uh, but they will have things in here. People will use terminology. Um, people will say things that you're probably not going to agree with. They're going to misuse the word pastor. They're going to insert the word reverend. Um, and they're probably going to mention people like they did last time that we may not agree with everything that they say. Um, you know, but it, this is an adult class. Uh, so there's, you know, the expectation of, you, you know, we realize that's out there. Um, but that's not going to keep us from seeing the point uh, because, you know, we have a sense of maturity about us that allows us to do that. Uh, so just be aware um, that's not the, uh, you know, we're here at the end, so I doubt we're going to see any more. Uh, but just be reminded, uh, simply because they say those things, that doesn't mean that, you know, we advocate those misuses of terminology and, you know, the mentioning of these things that we would certainly never uh, agree with. Uh, but, but, go ahead, Tim. The elders of the church know what this series is about. We've seen the movie. We know the things that are going to be said. So this is not anything new. It's not like you didn't know that was going to be there. We knew that was going to be there. You know, as far as the Billy Graham part, I'm not worshiping Billy Graham. I'm not following Billy Graham. But the message that Billy Graham was pointing out is let your Christian light shine in this world. That part I agree with. So, you know... Get the goodness out of this movie, like Dad said. Pentecost Park Church of Christ may not agree with everything that was said in that movie or done in that movie, but there was very, some very, very good points, and that's what we want to look at. We want to take the goodness out of this. Yeah, and it was a great point, uh, and uh, it's one of those points that, you know, I don't know if those things, I, I'm, I'm assuming that that actually happened, that actually did occur. Uh, about the candle thing and people actually did call because they thought it was on fire. Now, that's a pretty powerful point. Uh, and, but it's, you know, the, the thing that we really need to take about it is, take from it, is that it's that one light in, in the midst of a, a sea of darkness uh, that can really, really make a difference. So, you know, yeah, humility is great um, and um, we should always be humble. Uh, but that's not a, a that's not a stumbling block, nor is it a hurdle, and, and nor should it ever be um, for us to let our light shine. Well, you know, I, I don't want to put myself out there. Well, that's just that's just that's not really hum humility. That's more, you know, something else. You know, humility uh, is 
Um, humility is very, very important, uh, and we should never, you know, lack humility. Uh, but uh, I think that when we fully grasp what humility truly is, uh, then we will let our light shine more. Amen. Because we realize that true humility gives God the sovereignty of our life. Amen. And we're driven forward by him. Uh, and, man, that's a powerful thing. You know, uh, in the back of the van, uh, you know, uh, of course, I, I drive in here every Sunday morning, kind of early. Um, and uh, this morning, three people stopped me. Uh, every red light I hit, three people stopped me and rolled their window down and took the time to say, I like what you got on your van, brother. Yeah, they don't know me from Adam. I've never met them. They're calling me brother, and they're telling me they like it. And you know what the back of the van says? All things are possible with God, basically. Yeah, you, you know, you, you let your light shine, people, people see it. Amen. And, and it will have an impact. Great points, Paul. Great points. Anyone else? Things that just kind of impacted you, or things that got you thinking, or things that you thought uh, about it. Beth. It is. And, and, you know, if, if I'm being totally honest, when I'm driving around with, with the van, I call this a flaw on my part. I call this just negative thinking. I'm kind of waiting for the person to come and give me the opposite reaction. You know what I mean? Yeah. I haven't had that at all. I, I, and it's been, uh, it's, been, it's been good for me because then it just tells me, you know, you're thinking wrong about this. You know, you ought not worry about that. Uh, but, you know, there's plenty of things that you can you know, and should be doing. Um, so, all right. Anything else? Shirley. Just in, in that same sense, is what I like about that sign on my car is that I get to read it so many times. Every time I look in my rearview mirror, it's talking to me. And that's what I love about it. It keeps reminding me. Well, yeah, that's true. When you get in your car, you know, you see it and that. And when my kids get in my car, it tells them that they might actually live through it this time. Yeah, I'm just kidding. All right, Tim. But just a heads up, today there's not going to be any writing. They're not changing the things this week. They're changing them next week. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Sounds good. All right, so let's jump into the lesson, unless somebody else has anything that they want to share from kind of off the top. We essentially have a couple weeks left, guys, and then we're done with uh, the Woodlawn series. Uh, and um, uh, how many people have not seen the movie? I mean, I know we're doing the study, but haven't seen the movie? Okay, how many of us would like to see the movie, even if you've seen it once already? Okay. All right, then uh, we'll, have to arrange, we'll have to arrange a time when we can set it up here at the building and, and show it. Uh, it. It's a good movie. Uh, it's a good movie. Um, and I think you'll, I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, but if we didn't get it done at the beginning, maybe hopefully we can get it done by the end, uh, and you can actually see the see the movie as, as a whole. But let's uh, let's go ahead and jump in uh, and uh, look, begin looking at the the questions. Uh, the verse that's kind of uh, set before us at the beginning of the lessons is a back uh, three two. Uh, it says, "Lord, uh, I have heard your." heard of your fame, I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time, make um, them known. Make them known. Um, we, we all face these disappointments in life. Uh, we, we all face these difficulties and, and they come to us uh, and you know, we, we continually ask ourselves the, the, the question of, you know, how are we supposed to you know, react uh, to these things? Uh, and there are several different choices we can make, right? Uh, one of those is we can be very, very visceral about it. Uh, you know, it's just, well, it comes, I feel this way, and I'm going to let my feelings kind of take the wheel and, you know, drive this bus uh, to wherever it needs to go. Um, does that ever work out? I mean, you know, people who, someone makes you mad. And you say, okay, well, I'm mad, and I have every right to be mad, and I'm going to let my anger just kind of take over. 
is that a positive way to kind of view the way things are? I mean, people do that, right? You know, people do that uh, and uh, they allow that to, to happen. But uh, I'm pretty sure that we, we understand from the Bible that that's not uh, the, the appropriate thing. Specifically with regard to anger, Paul himself would say, you know, be angry and sin not. All right? I mean, there are times when we should be angry, uh, but that anger is never a, never a, a jumping off point for us to actually commit uh, some uh, sin against God or, or uh, you know, treat somebody uh, in, in an uh, inappropriate uh, way. Um, we can be purely, you know, driven by, you know, our reason. Um, well, here's the problem. So I'm going to sit down. I'm going to analyze, you know, the problem. I'm going to overcome it. And then I'm just going to kind of walk through, you know, the steps and, uh, and take care of it uh, and not really include anything else. Well, okay. That might, that might get you to where you need to be, um, but it kind of lacks something, doesn't it? You know, I mean, there's plenty of ways we can react, All right? So what do we do when disappointments come? Um, how do we work through uh, all of the things that, you know, are going to come to our, our lives? Man, am I on the wrong one? No, that's right. So how do we work through disappointments? Discouragements. Kind of weird that we end the whole series this way. Anyone? Nobody? Well, let's read some verses. Let's go to the Bible and let's look at... Um, uh, let's turn over to... Hold on. Um, Ephesians. In the book of Ephesians, uh, we're going to begin. Going to begin. No, it's not Ephesians. Where's my notes? There it is. All right, let's start off with, uh, let's go back to the Psalms. That's it. I don't know why I lost that. Go back to the Psalms, uh, and we're going to begin reading it. Psalm 48. And we're going to be skipping around. We're just going to kind of work our way forward. Uh, Psalm 48, look at uh, verse uh, 13. Start at verse 12. He says, walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider, yeah, consider her ramparts, go through her citadels, and that you may tell uh, the next uh, generation. What am I doing? Yeah. How, overcoming the discouragement uh, and disappointments. Well, one of the things that we have to remember uh, is that uh, we can get stuck, Right? Uh, you can kind of get stuck. Have you ever known anybody who was stuck? I mean, something comes along in their, their life, uh, and, it, and it's such a huge sort of uh, thing for them. Uh, they, they almost get stuck in that moment. Uh, and they allow that, that thing to, to kind of keep them where uh, they are. So much so uh, that they don't really ever move, move forward. Well, well, there's a big danger with that. And the biggest one that we're going to talk about is that it, it fails... Well, it, it, it causes us to, to fail to see uh, the, the need to look forward to the next generation, right? This whole last thing, and we've been preaching the sermons for a while, is about, you know, not just overcoming those disappointments. We've talked about that a good bit already, but overcoming them to the point where we can, we can actually make a difference to the next generation. Uh, if it's simply about, you know, if what we teach the next generation simply becomes about, you know, where we failed or, or because we're stuck here, uh, then they're never going to move, you know, forward. Uh, but we need to look to that next generation. And so that's going to be kind of point number one. What are we, what kind of legacy are, are we leaving? Um, what kind of, um, what kind of teaching are, are we giving? Are, are we leaving the legacy that is appropriate uh, to the message of Christ, um, what will 
the next generation, you know, say? What will they say? Uh, and, and you know, it's it's somewhat. Um, have you ever, ever had one of those moments where you were kind of disappointed in, in that? Uh, you know, you <laughs> you're talking to somebody uh, and they are relaying something back to you about uh, you know, your life in general, and, and what they're saying just has nothing to do with reality, uh, and yet they seem to believe that it is, and, and it, it can be kind of a disappointing thing. Um, but it's up to people, it's up to us to bridge the gap and, and to make sure that uh, these <clears throat> Christian principles, that revival, that counting the cost, that, you know, having these, all of these things that we've talked about, them being able to overcome disappointments by going through those steps that we talked about, make, make sure that persists. Beth. Okay. Yeah, the funny point is, we always want our we always want our kids to have things we didn't have. But you know what? That's got to include religion too. You know what? Maybe I didn't pray enough, or maybe I didn't. so. Then you know, raise your kids with the same idea that I want them to be better than me as far as you know, you know, worshiping God or you know having God in your lives or you know something like that. We always yeah, birthday parties. We always have these huge birthday parties for our kids. We want better for our kids. Well, we've got to do the same thing in religion. You know, show them, you know, how to be close to God. Okay. All right. Very good. Yeah. There's just a couple passages that we're going to look through here in the Psalms that that tell us about the importance uh, of that. Um, go forward to Psalm 71. Verse 18. So even the old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation. A generation, your power to all of those uh, who come. And skipping over to Psalm 78. If my iPad will cooperate. 78 uh, verses 1 through 8. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to, my, <clears throat> to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from old things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell them, tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was <clears throat> not faithful to God. All right, so stop. we're going to stop on this one for just a, a minute. Uh, and you'll notice here, he says it several times, uh, and he actually kind of spans a, a few generations. He goes all the way back and he says, look, you know, th our fathers were taught these things, you know, by God. Uh, and through these promises uh, given to God, and they taught generations all the way up uh, to our generation. And then he goes even further and says, you know, we have to teach um, that next generation as well. Uh, and then he gives a couple of positive reasons and some negative reasons, doesn't he? Right? He, he says that um, <clears throat> he says that that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, uh, but keep His commandments. Uh, now, you'll notice here that little word but is, is, a, is a contrast. Uh, it sets things in opposition to one another. 
um, you know, if, if this is the case, then this is not going to be the case, or if this is not the case, then this, or they are opposites, contrasting. Uh, so he uh, says uh, that, you know, if they're going to have hope in God, if they're not going to forget uh, the, the works of God, uh, then they'll keep his commandments. Uh, they, you know, so uh, how does that all begin? Well, by teaching the next generation. Then, verse, uh, verse 8, uh, if we don't, well, then they'll be like many of their fathers, uh, stubborn, rebellious, um, not steadfast, uh, and whose spirit is not faithful uh, to God. I mean, how can people be faithful to God? How can people be committed to him uh, if they've never been taught anything uh, about him? Anything about him? You know, you, you, you can't know things that you've never been taught, right? Uh, so we need to teach. Uh, and there's a purpose behind that teaching, uh, to provide hope uh, and, and uh, you know, the things you mentioned. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's a great point, and one that we always need to keep in mind. You know, go back and you borrow Paul's words uh, from 1 Corinthians. You know, um, I've planted Apollos water, God gives the increase. And isn't that the way you really want it? I mean, is it, it you know, when it comes to that whole increase part, if that really were to rely upon us in our efforts, in our raw ability, do you think it would be as much as it actually is now? I mean, have you ever thought about that? Why is it, why is it God's job to give the increase? You know, what, why, is, why is that on his end? Um, there's several reasons. The, one of the biggest ones is we just don't know what peop- is in people's hearts. Right. We don't know whether they're taking it to heart or not. We, we don't know, you know, what's going on in, in here and in here. And, you know, God sees that and God works things. And uh, let me get John and I'll come up to you, Hank. Yeah, I was just going to say that if, if it was left to us based on our nature, you know, it would just be more and more and more, right? And, and you're never satisfied until you have more and more. When you give that, that over to God, when we have a very specific role and responsibility, and he's taking
I think you're right. I think that uh, if it were if it were on us, it, it would become more of some sort of you know well, numbers game. It, it would become more of a, about the you know some kind of you know business strategy or paradigm in, in which we you know could simply increase the volume. You know what I mean? Uh, and um, don't get me wrong, we do see that, don't we? You know, you look at the world around you and you do see that there are groups in this world who that's, that's what they're about, or at least it looks that way. You know, try not to certainly be judgmental of anybody. Uh, but, um, you know, when you go and you listen to the message, that's the way it comes off, uh, that it is a numbers game. Uh, and that's what our primary concern uh, is. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, God uh, takes that part and, and says, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to worry about that. Um, you know, I, I've got that one. Our job is to plant and to water. You know, and what that looks like is you go and you teach, and then you encourage, and you strengthen. And maybe you teach a little bit more, and then encourage and strengthen. And then sometimes it's just a matter of sitting back and just being available. Um, and letting folks know, hey, my door's always open. You know, feel free to come ask anything. Glenn. Right. We have in the past. Always looking for one more to present, and then he'll deal with the increase part. But we always need to be trying to present. Right. I, I, think, I think what you're saying is, is that you can't see these things as set in opposition to one another. My, my planting and watering is not in opposition to God's increase, nor can I use you know, God giving the increase as a reason for me not planting and watering. Well, God's got that. Well, no, that you've got to be looking to people. You've got to be looking for people. You've got to be spreading. You've got to be teaching, you know, uh, lest that next generation come. And, you know, we're not, to use best words, better off, uh, but we've actually declined. Things have gone, you know, downhill, so to speak. Um, and again, when it comes to that type of thing, um, we, we typically do look at, you know, numbers. But, anyhow, Hank. You, you mentioned First Corinthians and Paul, and he talked about, I planted and Apollos watered. In the same context there, he talks about that every man's work is going to be tested. You know, so be careful how you build you know, on the foundation of which Christ is the cornerstone. He said every man's work is going to be tested. I'm convinced there that he's talking about uh, uh, the the content of what it is that we are, are teaching and the care and the effort. You know, um, in the parable of the, of the sower in Luke's account, at least, he says the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. You know, so it, I think it's interesting. I'm not making a mistake in the past of thinking that God gives the increase, which he does, but in the most basic sense that God gives the increase is because of the fact that it's his seed that's being planted. We wouldn't even have any seed that could right. grow if, he, if we didn't have this, this inspired word. James wrote in the King James Version, and it's a funky verse, but it's only by the way. It says that, uh, uh, Wherefore, they impart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. You know, so, so we have these seeds. We can't make a seed, but we have the, the seed of the kingdom. And we plant it into the right soil with the right care and effort. It's going to grow in this. God gets all the credit because uh, it's like saying, you know, we told, told someone, uh, we taught someone, look at this zinnia I made. You didn't make no zinnia. You know what I mean? You seed in there or whatever. That sounded like a dig. It's God's seed. We're just planning. We got to be careful. Yeah, and you know, we, we, we sometimes speak about these things in that, uh, what I would call accommodative language. You know, trying to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to do? And, and where is it that I step across that line into things that, you know, where, well, God doesn't want me there, you, you know, or, you know, so sometimes we use this language, but, but in reality, you're right. You know, from, from first to last, the process, the, uh, the foundation, the, the building, the completion, 
It's all God's. Yeah. yeah, great point. Anyone else? Yeah. Tim, go ahead. What we have to remember, and you want to be humble, but go ahead, go door knock. You'll get humble. But what you have to remember when you're door knocking, the one thing you have to remember is you're sitting there going, I got to know, I got to know, I got to know, I got to know. But you have to remember that the Word of God will not come back void. If you're going to, there's going to be, it's going to happen positive. Sooner or later, it's going to happen positive. Because Bible says it's not going to come back. Boy, God won't let that happen. Okay. Jeannie. Uh, Jehovah Witnesses heard that from the door to door. Okay? I think what we should do is like we pass out food to people, pass out information what this church is all about. That's one start. Figure out how we can have programs to draw, uh, draw people in. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think Tim was just using that kind of as a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, uh, but you're right. <clears throat> you know, we... we it, that, and that's, that's where... Yeah, the whole thing is God's, but they're, they're, you know, we're working within that. Because we are in His kingdom and we are His children. And <clears throat> these are the things that we are, uh, you know, called to, to do. And, and it's us, up to us to, to figure out in our generation... You know, what are the things that have the greatest impact? Uh, you know, what are the things that we can use um, to, you know, bring people in uh, to, to get that, that message spread as widely as, you know, possible? And, and it's different in this generation than it was in the last uh, and then the one before it. Now, the word stays the same. Uh, the word stays the same uh, and uh, never changes. I mean, it shouldn't, you know, and, and it should be reflected in our teaching that, it's always the same. Um, that doesn't mean we're always going to present it the same way. That doesn't mean we're always going to um, use the same methodology, you know, per se. But, um, eh, how? Hey. Okay. Guys, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, we're just going to call quits uh, for the day. Uh, the bell's going to ring any second now. Uh, continue to do the homework through the end of the lesson, uh, and um, uh, we'll come back next week to talk about it. Okay. If you would, you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, uh, in just a little bit, we're going to be going through verses 22 through 33. Uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to read all those verses, but most of us are familiar with the story. Most of us are familiar with this incident in the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we don't string it all together. Sometimes we know this story as separate from the story before it, as separate from the story that comes after it. But I want you to think for just a minute. If you go back and just kind of, if you have one of those Bibles that sort of peruses through a chapter by giving you headings, I want you to take a look just very quickly at this day in the life of Christ. Now, I don't know that every single thing that happens here happens in a single day period. But if we imagine it as being a single day, walking from the morning through the early morning to the afternoon and into the evening. By the time you're done considering the topics that seem to back up into the life of Christ, into the ministry that he is giving, you realize that this is one incredible day. The day begins on a not-so-pleasant note, where Jesus receives word that John the Baptist has been killed. He's been in prison for some time, and of course we know how that story goes. We know about the dance, and we know about the king, and we know about his word, and we know about how he really didn't want to do it. But he ends up beheading John the Baptist. Christ receives word of that. 
and he takes a boat and he tries to get by himself. The crowds won't let him be by himself and they begin to to come upon him. So he begins to teach them, despite no doubt his grief. I mean, not only was John a a friend, and not only was he a fellow laborer and the forerunner of who he was, but he was his family as well. But the crowd just comes and comes and comes, and Christ just teaches on. And immediately following, we have that scenario where he is going to end up feeding the 5,000. And then after that crowd begins to disperse, Christ tells the disciples to get in the boat and start their journey. He goes up into the mountains to pray. And then things begin to turn bad for those who are on the water. The storm comes and begins to toss the boat and Christ comes walking on the sea. And of course they cry out that it's a ghost. Peter recognizes who he was, and he asked if he could get out of the boat. If it's you, Lord, let me get out of the boat and walk to you on the water. And he gets out of the boat, and he begins his journey, but then slowly he begins to to sink. And he asks to be saved by Jesus, and he receives that rebuke. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? You know, every time I read the stories and the chapters like this in the Bible, and you see in the face of just great challenge, these men, like Peter, doing great things. You see the miraculous taking place. I can't help but be somewhat disconnected from that. And I think most people are. I mean, after all, we we don't live in an age where those miraculous things in that sense occur. To us, it's more akin to the whole superhero idea. Superheroes have made a comeback, you know. They come back every once in a while, you know, and you see some of those old characteristics. It's funny, you know, to hear some of the kids talk about some of these, you know, superheroes and, you know, as as if it's kind of a new thing. When they've been around for a long, long time, many of them dating back to really earlier wars, and these heroes being given to kind of encourage and strengthen. But we think of it in that way. These guys were not superheroes. They were people who were just like us. Peter was a guy who was really no different. Aside from the fact that he did have, later on, the ability to do certain miraculous things that were given to him by the power of God, and yet we know that all things are possible with God, even for us in our generation. But sometimes we compartmentalize this idea of what it means to do, quote, superhuman things. And we resign it to an area in which we find ourselves saying, we'll never reach that. That's not who we are. That's not where I am. And yet that is very far from the truth, isn't it? See, I grew up watching people on TV who had, you know, x-ray vision and, you know, able to summon all kind of animals. And, you know, uh, the one I never understood was the Wonder Twins thing. That was kind of weird. But, you know, uh, but I mean, they had these powers. And as a kid, you know, you're thinking and... Man, wouldn't it be great if you could do those kind of things? Wouldn't it be amazing if you had that kind of of power? But we realize as we grow older that that's just not the case. And unfortunately, we kind of convince ourselves that just like the child who grows out of the superhero sort of mentality, we as Christians can sometimes grow out of that supernatural mentality. And that's unfortunate, because truly with God, all things are possible. Now we can say it and say it and say it and say it, but you know what? It's got to be something that is in our heart, and it's got to be something that possesses us each and every day. And it's important that it does, 
Because this idea of us doing these impossible things, things that we would otherwise resign to the kind of that, uh, you know, superhero realm, is vital to not just our success spiritually, but it's vital to the success of the next generation. Are they going to look at people who say, yes, all things are possible with God, and then go out each and every day and live that? What kind of legacy do we leave for our children? And I go to this incident in the life of Peter because I think it demonstrates well the three main ingredients when it comes to to zeal that that have to be present. Now, there's a lot we could say about zeal. We could talk about fire and how it burns and how we should stoke that fire. We can go back into the Old Testament and look at examples of zeal. But let's narrow it down to Peter's actions here. And let's consider for just a a minute three things in this small little story about a guy who was in a boat and told himself, I can walk on water. And then did. That wasn't his power. But he did it nonetheless. Three things. Number one. Peter always had a zeal to be with Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, think about some of the things in the life of ministry. This isn't the first time that Peter is going to see Jesus afar off and go to him. You remember that there's occasion at the end kind of of Christ's time here on earth. They're out fishing. They're out fishing and he yells out and he tells them what? Cast your nets. On the other side, right, they bring in this great draft of uh, fishes and Peter instantly recalls this happened before. And he says out loud, it is the Lord. And without hesitation, he tears off his garments, dives in the water and goes to be with Jesus. Now, Peter's a human being and Peter doesn't always do that. But overwhelmingly, Peter has this just amazing zeal to be with Jesus. He dives in the water. He walks on the water. When Christ talks about being persecuted, Peter's the first to jump in and give defense. And on and on you could go. Peter just had this great desire. Here he is again, calling out to him, Lord, let me come to you and walk on the water. And I think Peter, in his mind, knew certain things were the case. He knew there were certain things about Jesus that were vital for him. For instance, he knew that Jesus had the ability to calm storms. This isn't the only time this is ever going to occur. And this is the same Jesus who at the storm one time said, peace, be still, and it was calm. And on that occasion as well, they heard the words, why do you have such a small faith? Peter understood that. And Peter understood that if he wanted greater faith and he wanted that calmness and stillness, that he would have to go to Jesus. He knew that Jesus was the one that was in control. Even the winds and the waves obey him. I mean, after all, here he is coming to them, walking on the water. But I think most importantly, Peter understood that Jesus alone could save his soul. I mean, what do we understand about Jesus? I mean, why are we gathered here this morning? Why do we even talk about him? And those things that you could list in your mind are those things that we've made real in our lives. We turn over to, to John. Just hold your place there. Turn over to the book of John in chapter 6 and begin reading with me at verse 66. <clears throat> and after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go away as well? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, 
And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. And I love the way that Peter says it with such conviction. It's almost as if you can hear it in his voice, just how convicted he is. Who are we going to go to? I mean, it's almost as if I can't even fathom the question. Who are we going to go to? Who else has these words that, that are powerful and lead us to, to this eternity with, with God? Peter always had this zeal to be with Jesus. Do we have that same kind of zeal? I mean, no matter where you are. I mean, Peter was out fishing. Peter was sitting in the synagogue. Peter was in an upper room. Peter was all over with him. And everywhere he seems to go, including that garden scene on that night before the crucifixion, Peter is there and seemingly ready to always step up. Do we always have a zeal to be with Jesus? Now, let me say this because I think it's something that we don't often speak but perhaps need to, to hear. Does this always mean you are going to feel like doing the things that you know you should? Does that mean that every Sunday morning when that alarm clock goes off, you're going to jump out of bed and say, all right, I'm going over here, I'm doing this, and I've got everything going, and it's for God. You're always going to feel that way, right? Wednesday night comes around, you've worked a hard day and, and things have happened that don't even normally happen and you've still got stuff to do before you can go to bed that night and, man, I can't wait for Bible study. You're not always going to feel that way because zeal is not necessarily a function of how you feel. Zeal instead is something that has a deeper, not only purpose, but root. But the surface of it should be this. We should always have this fire that leads us to want to be with Jesus. Let me give you the perfect example of kind of what I'm talking about. This guy by the name of Paul. Everybody knows Paul, right? He wrote to a young man by the name of Timothy. And one of the first things that he tells Timothy when he's writing Timothy, and I sometimes think we just read right over this. He tells Timothy, be sure you fan into flames, right? Fan into flames, this gift, this, this ministry, this work, this ability that God has given you. And if you think for a minute about what Paul tells Timothy, what you begin to realize is that Timothy was a young man who was really discouraged. Timothy was a young man whose, we could say, zeal was waning. He wasn't always on fire, and he maybe have lost focus. And that's how we are sometimes. You may not always feel zealous, but zealous doesn't necessarily depend on just how you feel. Number two. Zeal leads, should say, to service. Zeal leads to service. Zeal is that fire for God, but zeal that really doesn't have any work to do is kind of like a fire without any fuel to burn, right? The fuel to burn is the service that we render because we are zealous for God. It's not enough for us to say, man, I'm really zealous for God. Well, okay, well, what are you doing about it? How are you showing your zeal? You know, it's kind of like matchstick religion. You know, you light that matchstick and you stand there and you hold it. And eventually, what happens? Well, number one, it burns you. <laughs> but number two, there's just not enough fuel there for that to go. It's going to burn out. And, and it's not going to, I mean, it's going to burn out quickly. I remember when I was a kid, you know, around Christmas time, we, one of the things we got excited about is that mom would always bust out this box. It was about this long, about this, you know, square. She would bust out this box, and we would get to take out the long matchsticks and go around and light these candles that, that we had. 
that were, what does he call them? We put them out, the Luminaria. You ever, you ever see those? I, I still don't understand what it was all about, but you know, it looked really, really cool. You know, snow on the ground, and you had these bags, and they were glowing, and, but you had to use these long sticks. Even those long mat sticks, they burn out. You had to have more fuel. Fire will burn as long as it has fuel. The same thing with zeal. You've got to have something to do. You've got to give it direction. See, zeal for some is really nothing more than idle talk. Oh, I'm on fire for God. Oh, I'm a spiritual person. Oh, I do that. But you've got to actually do something with it. Go over to James very quickly. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Notice with me just verses 22 through 25. <clears throat> But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and the perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. How do we keep zeal going? How do we keep that fire going? You keep it going by service. You keep it going by service. Now, Peter didn't always get it right, did he? As a matter of fact, he messed it up pretty big sometimes. Sometimes Christ would have to look at him and say things like, get behind me, Satan. You know, I don't know. I don't think I'd ever want to hear those words. But one thing that Peter had was always that willingness to act. Always that willingness to throw that log on the fire. Now, sometimes he got burnt by it. But he was always stoking those flames, always seeking Christ, always trying to do and trying to be what he thought Christ and God expected him to be. Now, words must become ways and work for us to do and for how or for, you know, means to serve others. Peter didn't always get it right, and you're not going to always get it right, and I'm not going to always get it right, and, you know, now Philip, he might always get it right, but that's Philip. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we, nobody gets it all right. But we've got to have that zeal, and that zeal's got to lead us to actually do something, to serve. And the final thing that we want to look at is zeal was brought by adversity. Zeal was brought by adversity. Zeal has roots, right? Zeal has roots. And hopefully the zeal that we have is produced by some of these roots that are really foundational types of roots. Now, sometimes our zeal starts because of, you know, I'm, I don't want to go to that place called hell. I want to be in that place called heaven. Hopefully that develops into some larger ideas such as, I love the Lord. He has been so good to me. But one of the things that oftentimes brings great zeal is adversity that we have to go through. Is the trial. Is the struggle. Do you think Peter was better after this ordeal? I mean, he, he put his faith out there, right? Christ comes walking along and, you know, Lord, if will let me come out and, and walk to you on the water. He gets out there. He begins to sink. Peter was the kind of guy who would use that adversity to become better. A lot of folks, when they come up against that wall, when they come up against that trouble, they kind of internalize it. And they turn it into sort of negative things. Why is this being done to me? And how could this possibly happen? And why is it always this? And why is it always... And we get that court sort of woe is me thing going on. And it really doesn't do anything more than just destroy us from the inside out. Peter was the kind of guy who would take these things, even some very stern rebukes, as we've already mentioned, and allow them to make him better. Wasn't that he wasn't offended? Wasn't that his feelings weren't hurt? Wasn't that it was, you know, difficult to the point that it's sometimes he thought to himself, I'm not going to make it. And neither is it for us, right? You know, when James says, count it all joy when you fall into various 
trials, he's not saying that flippantly. He's not saying that you won't have struggles with it, that it won't be something that really, really puts you to the test. Almost as if you'll be sitting there thinking, man, God's asking me to walk on water and he knows I can't do that. But with God, all things are possible, right? And through that adversity, you can gain that patience. And that patience, when it has its perfect work, can do amazing, amazing things. Again, look at the life of Peter. Here's the guy that denied Christ's power. Here's the guy that denied Christ's plan. Here's the guy that denied Christ three times as he was getting ready to be crucified. And yet, by the time we hit the day of Pentecost, Peter is still hanging in there. He may not have believed everything, and, and certainly I don't, I don't think he, he believed that Christ was going to rise from the grave. The Bible tells us that. But he does. And slowly but surely, out of that adversity, comes a man who will stand on the day of Pentecost and boldly proclaim before his Hebrew brethren, you have killed the Son of God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. It's the same man who would stand before the Pharisees and stand before their leaders and say, we ought to obey God rather than men. It's the same man who would be a leader in the church there in Jerusalem and be a part of that turning of the world upside down for Christ. When it comes to zeal, it always has to have that focus on Christ. But not just Christ, on service and service rendered to him. And what we have to realize is that sometimes it comes to us in very different, difficult ways. But will we rise to that challenge? And will we be the zealous people that we need to be ever pursuing God's will not just for our lives but so that others can prosper as well you see if you're interested in, in leaving that legacy behind then these things will be clearly discernible I believe to others I mean think about it for the child that looks on and never sees you pick up a Bible never hears you say the name Jesus how will they ever know that he is their savior. The child that looks on, who hears you say Jesus and pick up the Bible and yet you never do a day's service in your life. What are they gonna think? The child that looks on and sees you go through trouble only to watch you lean upon the savior's everlasting arms and give it to him and have that kind of faith how much will that impact their lives? I would dare say it has a great impact. It will lead them to do the same and to have that same kind of steadfast, sometimes slow burn, sometimes bright burn, but nonetheless burning for God that we have in our lives. Maybe you're here this morning and zeal is not really the problem. It's more of connection. If you really want to, to burn bright spiritually, if you really want to have that kind of relationship with him, then there are things that we must do. The Bible spells them out. We must pick up the word of God and read it and understand it, come to know it. Let it convict our hearts. Lead us to this place where we have faith or strong conviction. That strength of conviction leads us to want to 
repent of our sins and confess the name of our Lord. Go into the waters of baptism to be washed clean. Rise to walk in newness of life. Maybe that's where you need to begin. Let the fire begin there and let it grow ever stronger. Maybe your flame is flickering and maybe you're just getting beat down and maybe you need prayers and maybe you need to make confession. If you're here this morning and you have need, make it known as together we stand and sing.